Okay, today we're going to be doing a pretty in-depth study on the Millennial Kingdom. What is the Millennial Kingdom? What is the purpose of the Millennial Kingdom? How to, to have inheritance in the Millennial Kingdom? Um, we're going to be covering some interesting things. Let's start out in Revelation chapter 19. I do have a study already out on the premillennial, why a Bible believer must be premillennial. I get into a lot of detail on the proof of a premillennial coming of Jesus Christ. In other words, there's three different things. There's premillennial, which means Jesus comes at the beginning and is there for the whole thing. Postmillennial means man sets up the kingdom of peace for a thousand years and Jesus shows up at the end. Postmillennial. Amillennial means there is no millennial kingdom. We're actually in it right now. That's what Catholicism teaches. And, you know, Christ's church is what rules physically on the earth. With the Pope as the replacement of Jesus Christ, which of course is satanic. <laughs> so there's only one option, and that is the premillennial coming of Jesus Christ, proved from Scripture, which I'll be showing you here. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. Let's start there. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, capital W. Look in John chapter 1, verse, verses 1 down through there, and you'll see who this Word, capital W, manifest Word of God is. Verse 14, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Now, this is Jesus Christ. We'll continue here. Uh, well, finish the verse. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Okay. Um, if Jesus Christ comes at the end of the millennial kingdom, how is he going to be ruling the nations with a rod of iron? I guess from heaven or something, you know? So you have to be premillennial if you believe in just lit literally reading the Bible. Verse 16. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, <coughs> excuse me, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the the horse and against his army. <clears throat> and the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. This is speaking about Jesus Christ destroying the Antichrist, the false prophet, and their army. And the birds actually come down and, and, you know, have a nice meal. See, the Lord's very nice to his creatures, you know, the birds. Chapter 20, let's go there. And again, we're going to see this thing of premillennial coming of Jesus Christ. It says here, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Jesus doesn't go back up and let man run the kingdom down here. I mean, it's absurd. You know, I mean, I, I have an interesting little chart here. It's in the back of my uh, Bible. And all of the great empires down through, and most of them only last, last about 200 to 300 years before they fall apart. Man has never been able to get anywhere near a thousand-year kingdom. Not going to happen. And it plainly says they live and reign with Christ a thousand years. Verse 5, 
but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Could it be any plainer? I actually saw this post-millennial guy the one time, and he was like, you know, the scripture is there in Revelation chapter 20, verses uh, 4 and verse 6, do make post-millennial teaching a little bit difficult. It's like, yeah, it's called it overthrows it. All right, so we see there is a millennial kingdom, which means a thousand years. Again, you go to 2 Peter chapter 3, you'll read about one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. God created the earth in six days and rested the seventh day. 6,000 years of history, war, fighting, death, you know, all the bad stuff. Seventh, the, the seventh uh, thousandth year is a day of rest. thousand years of rest. Jesus Christ running the whole thing. All right. Plainly there. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Again, I'm going to show you the danger in uh, people saying, well, I don't really think that, you know, I think that maybe he comes down, but then he probably goes back up again or something like this. No. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 7. Remember the days of old concerning the, or consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father and he will show thee, thy elders and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel talked about that in my study of interracial marriage. There are 12 natural boundaries. Okay, That's why, and this goes into Acts chapter 17, verse 26. God set the bounds of their habitation. Excuse me, God determined the bounds of their habitation. <laughs> you know, sorry about that. One of you corrected me on that. I've been wrong. I keep saying, I don't know why I get to say set. I don't know why. I don't know. Maybe it's, you know, I, I use new versions for like 25 years of my life, so... Maybe if one of them said, you know, set, and I just have it in my head. It's determined, you know, the bounds of their habitation. I caught myself this time. <laughs> so, you know, but it's New Testament. Okay, this is before the giving of the law. All right. So it applies to us today. You know, but uh, look at verse 9. This is important. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Wait a second. You say, but I thought the whole earth is God's. Yeah, it is. But you see, Jesus Christ is going to physically rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years to show that only God manifest in the flesh can truly make peace. It's his inheritance. Hmm. Interesting. Psalm 2 Go next to Psalm 2. So all these post-millennialists are really, in reality, they're trying to take his inheritance from him. The Lord Jesus Christ's inheritance. Interesting. Psalm 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Oh, God wouldn't mock anybody. You just read it. Yes, he does. He has them in derision. He laughs at them. He mocks them. Hmm. Then it gets worse. <laughs> Verse 5. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion, I will declare to the, the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. You see it there? Verse 9, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. What do we read back in Revelation 19? He's going to rule them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Very, very interesting. 
You see, because Satan and his Jesuits have been killing off royalty. You know why? Look at this. Verse 10, Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, not elected officials. Be instructed, O ye, or be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Why do you think that they're so busy? They killed the czars in Russia. They killed the French royalty with the French Revolution. The American Revolution overthrew King George, the British monarchy. In Germany, you had the uh, Kaiser and things being destroyed by, the, by Hitler, essentially. And all these people that are destroying the crowned heads, they're all Jesuits or Catholic, tied to the Catholic system. Hmm. You see, God has special dealings with kings. That's why we use a uh, King James Version where the word of a king is, there is power. Very interesting. Very interesting study. But uh, you see, there is an inheritance that the Lord has that he's going to, he's been promised right there. He's been promised it and he's going to get it one day. And if you're saved, you can have a part in that inheritance. You can rule and reign with Christ for that thousand years. I'm going to show you the scriptures on it here as we continue. Next, go to Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 36. The passage that totally destroys replacement theology. Ezekiel, chapter 36, verse 16 Okay, it says here, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings. There was, their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman. Wherefore, I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for their idols wherewith they had polluted it. And I scattered them among the heathen, and they were dispersed through the countries according to their way and according to their doings. I judged them. And when they entered in... Unto the heathen, whither they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said to them, These are the people of the Lord, and are gone forth out of the, his land. Okay, and that's still true today. There's still a lot of Jews that are not back in Israel, and they belong in Israel. That's their country. That's a lot of the Lord's inheritance. But look what happens. Verse 21. But I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. Hmm. For I will take you from among the heathen, and gather you out of all countries, and will bring you into your own land." You know, a scary thing to think about is, uh, what did God have to do to get the Jews out of Germany and to get them back to Israel, World War II? You know, there's a lot of Jews in America right now, North America. What's God going to have to do to get them out of America and back to Israel? Something to think about. Verse 25, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. Okay, let me stop right there. Because again, the replacement theology heretics, be they white Aryan or black African or whatever, they will all do this thing, we're the true Jews, and they'll go through scriptures and try to prove things. Uh, it's talking about there, I will, you know, and ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. It's real estate, physical real estate. I'm the true Jew, man. I'm a true Jew. Okay, head for Israel. Geographic Israel. Don't tell me it's in Harlem. Don't tell me it's in Phoenix, Arizona, you know, or Tempe, Arizona. You know, oh, we're the true Jews. We're the true Jews. We've replaced it. You know, oh, okay, man, head for Israel. It's your land. Fight for it. They won't do it. Verse 29. 
I will also save you from all your uncleanness, and I will call for the corn and will increase it and lay no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree and increase of the field that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. And you're going to see that too, by the way, as we get into the study further on about the millennial kingdom. It's going to be amazing as far as farming is concerned. Verse 31. Then shall ye remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. Not for your sakes do I this, saith the Lord God, be it known unto you. Be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God, in the day that I have, shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities, and the wastes shall be builded, and the desolate land shall be tilled, tilled, farming, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. And they shall say, this land that was desolate is become like the garden of Eden, and the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and inhabited, and are inhabited. Then the heathen that are left round about you shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined places and plant that that was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Thus saith the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. I will increase them with men like a flock, as the holy flock, as the flock of Jerusalem in her solemn feasts. So shall the waste cities be filled with flocks of men, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Amen. I thank the Lord that we have a God that says, I will do it, thus saith the Lord. Not some little wishy-washy, effeminate, you know, sissy that's, well, maybe if it's okay with people and I'll have to check and, and see what the popular vote is or something. Uh-uh, no. When it comes to the millennial kingdom, Jesus Christ comes down and he goes, this is the way it's going to be done. Oh, uh, I got this nice rod of iron in my hand. Anybody want to question it? You know? <laughs> yep. But how do we have part in the millennial kingdom as Christians? All right. Second Timothy, excuse me, Second Timothy chapter two. Turning your Bible to Second Timothy chapter two, I want to show you uh, that yes, we do have part in it, and how to gain that inheritance. And I do believe that all members of the body of Christ are going to be there. It's just your level of inheritance, your level of of millennial rule or whatever you're going to see there. You know, we rule as kings and priests. So whichever one you are, I'm not sure. I don't know how it all works out, but uh, you know, the Lord's going to work that stuff out. I think it'll be the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to be given crowns of reward, plus also our millennial inheritance. We're going to be given our orders, so to speak, marching orders. And uh, we're going to be down here ruling and reigning with Christ for the thousand years. Again, to show the world, you say, why? I don't understand. Why not just go into eternity? Well, because then people would say, well, you know, I guess, you know, nobody could really rule the earth or anything. No, Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign on this earth to show that you can rule things down here without the greed and the corruption that man does. All right. So, and it's his inheritance that the Lord promised him. But let's read here, 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Okay? Uh, you have to tough it up sometimes. All right? Sometimes it's really difficult down here, and I know I've been through it plenty of times. I know a lot of you are struggling. You have to just be tough like a soldier sometimes. Realize that we are in war right now. All right? Look at verse 5. And if any man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. Hey, I've led thousands of people to the Lord. How'd you do that? Well, I just went around and I passed out candy and said, hey, pray this prayer. I'll give you some candy. And they prayed it and I gave them candy. So I've led thousands to the Lord. No, 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 no. You're not striving lawfully. You have to tell people about repentance to salvation. If you're not telling people about that, if you're not getting people convicted and having them understand that they're sinners and that they deserve hell, they're not going to get saved. It's as simple as that. They're praying an empty, meaningless prayer. They're believing in vain, like the Bible condemns in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But another thing, you say, well, I built a, a church building someplace and we draw people in with rock music. Oh, you're not striving lawfully. 
first of all, you're not supposed to have church buildings. There's nothing in Scripture that tells you to build a building and invite lost people into it. It's a pagan practice. That's the thing. It's not that it's just sort of a empty, nebulous, well, we just don't really know where it came from. The church building thing just kind of poof, appeared, and it's not mentioned in the New Testament, but it just kind of appeared after that. No, 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 no. It comes from paganism. The Catholics took it from the Greek pagan Parthenon temple where they're worshiping Aphrodite and Athena and all these other false gods. They took their Greek pagan temple. That's why you have the, the triangular roof and the columns out front. And then they put the phallus on top, the phallic obelisk on top of the thing. That's where it came from. So church buildings just didn't, oh, just, we don't really know. They just, Christians just started doing it after the first century was over. No, 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 no. Catholics did it. They got it from pagans. And you bring, you build a building like that, and then you fill it with rock music to bring in the people, and you say, look, I'm going to be crowned. No, you're not. You're not striving lawfully. See? Verse 6. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. We're going to see about that later on, too. The thing of being a husbandman and uh, laboring. See, God can't use you until you've been proven in battle. I mean, think about this. Brand new military recruit. We're just reading about enduring hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So you get some green recruit. He's just got through basic training. And you say, here are your orders, son. And he goes, oh, thank you, sir. And he looks down and he goes, you want me to go in in a, in a hit team uh, back behind enemy lines to take out some army general or something? Sir, uh, I've never even seen combat. Oh, don't worry about it. You'll be all right. Well, no, you don't send out soldiers on very difficult missions until they've been proven in battle. That's just common sense. Well, the Lord's not going to be able to use you for higher levels of Christian service until you've been proven in battle. That stuff comes with time. It isn't something where you say, well, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, just force my way into God's good graces and I'm just going to, I'm, I'm, you know, 16 years old and I've just gotten saved and, and yeah, I'm going to go full-time preaching by the time I'm 17. You're not ready for it. I see that sometimes. I mean, there's some really godly young teenagers and, and, and things. Praise the Lord for you. But you got to go through some stuff. Jesus Christ waited till he was 30. Okay. And that's the advice I give. You know, late 20s, early 30s is a good time to go into preaching. Before that, you're not ready. You're just not ready. You can do things for the Lord. You can serve the Lord. Absolutely. Sure. I'll never discourage a, a, a teenager from handing out tracks or for producing videos or whatever else. Fine. Not a problem. Full-time ministry, that's a different story. It is tough. It is very, very tough. I would not have been ready for this back even when I got saved when I was 25. Okay? So... But let's continue. Verse 7. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Not me, the Lord. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. <laughs> That's kind of funny. It's like, you know, we suffer trouble. If you're a Christian, you know that. You suffer trouble. And they try to threaten you and all the other stuff, but the word of God is not bound. You might be able to get rid of me, but you're not going to get rid of the book. Verse 10, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Talking about the Jews there. He's enduring all things. Paul in another place talks about, you know, uh, I, am, I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. That's what he's talking about here. He's saying he endures all things for the elect's sake. He's talking about it's not some Calvinistic thing that the elect people that are pre-chosen for salvation. No, no, no. That's not what's going on here. In context, he's talking about Jews. Okay, verse 11. Now, here we go. We start to get into the thing of how to obtain millennial reign. Verse 11. It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Here we go. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Okay, what's going on here? Well, verse 12, if we deny him, he also will deny us. Verse 13, he cannot deny himself. What's happening there is, it's not saying, verse 12 is not saying he's going to deny your salvation. Okay, he's going to 
somehow get you out of the body of Christ after being in it. That's not what's going on there. It's millennial reign in the context. He will deny you millennial reign if you deny him. If you are ashamed of Jesus Christ and his word, he'll be ashamed of you. Okay? Um, just continue here. Uh, verse 14, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Key scripture right there. But, shame, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Uh, you could pretty much rename YouTube as uh, profaneandvainbabblings.com. <laughs> you know, pretty easily. Well, there's plenty of it on YouTube here. And the Bible says you're to shun it. In other words, no, sorry. You know, well, don't you want to? No, I don't think so. Oh, you teach a post trib, you don't use the King James Bible. Uh, you say that Catholicism has the truth in it, it's just veiled or something. You listen to rock music or whatever else. Uh, there's no repentance involved with salvation. Uh, no, sorry. You shun it. Nope, profane and vain babblings. I don't think so. Simple. But you say, so. What do we have to do to get millennial inheritance? All you have to do is suffer as a Christian. Isn't that an encouragement for you ladies out there that are married to lost husbands? I know a couple of you, you know, I know about your personal situation there. You've shared it with me and stuff, my, my wife and I. And, and it's rough sometimes. Um, are you suffering for being a Christian, for having those stands saying, I don't want to watch TV? I want to dress differently. I want to look differently. I'm praying for you, honey, and stuff. And the guy and your husband mocks you and puts you down for it. You're suffering for Jesus Christ. And you're getting millennial reign. You young people, you teenagers that are living with lost relatives, lost parents, lost siblings and things, you're the only one that's saved and they call you crazy. Are you suffering for Jesus? Yes, you are. You're earning millennial reign. See, that's all that there is to it. Yeah. Your suffering is not in vain. Let that be an encouragement to you. You that have health problems because of living as a Christian, not because you're living in sin. You have financial problems. You have other types of problems. You are laying up treasures in heaven. You are earning millennial reign. All you got to do is just suffer. Pretty good deal, huh? Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> turn over there. Romans chapter 8, verse 12. Romans 8, verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, here we go again, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Let me stop right there for just a minute. Notice the conditional little two-letter word, I, F, if. You're a joint heir with Christ, but only if you suffer. See, you can pretend to be like the world as a Christian. You can live as a carnal Christian. When you get around people, you can laugh at their dirty jokes. You can watch television. You can, you know, live pretty much just as wickedly as the lost world. You can really deceive people. You know, there's an old saying, if there was a trial and you were, if you were put on trial, would there be enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian? Hmm, there should be. Something to think about. If you suffer as a Christian, you're going to reign with Jesus Christ. But look at verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. In us. 
we're going to get into this study later on here. I'm actually going to, the second part of the study is going to be actually looking at the characteristics of the millennial kingdom and seeing what this earth is going to be like for a thousand years. It is unreal. I mean, when you go through the scriptures and things and you look at all the different things that are going to be going on and how the earth is going to be responding to Jesus Christ as the creator here on earth, I mean, it's just going to be incredible. And you're 500 years into that time period. You think that you're going to think about uh, what people said about you right now? How people made fun of you and mocked you? How you were lonely? I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Keep that in mind. Whatever you're going through right now, it's going to be worth it. You know, the old hymn says, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Yeah, keep that in mind. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Another key scripture, another, this is probably my life verse. I love this one. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Yeah, I have lived that verse. <laughs> Believe you me, it's an amazing scripture. Um, even bad things that are happening down here on this earth. It's not that, you know, well, the Lord's just going to make you, your life just absolutely miserable. You can turn in your Bible to Galatians chapter 5. It's not that the Lord's just going to make your life absolutely miserable and you're just going to live in just poverty and bad health and whatever else. And, and because of that bad time, you get to live good in the millennial kingdom and then any, into eternity. No, no, no. That's Some of that will be there, but I'll tell you right now, there's times when you'll live, you'll have bad times and stuff that you'll go through, and God will just take that time, that stuff, and it works together for good in this life. I'm not going to lie to you like Joel Osteen would do and say, your best life is now, you know, your best life now. That's a satanic lie. Your best life is not now. Your best life is in eternity when we go to be with the Lord. Um, as far as, you know, I would say eternity for a Christian really begins at the rapture when we go up. You know, we come back down again, uh, like it says in John chapter 10. But, uh, you know, we live and rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years here on this earth and rebuild the earth after the mess that's made. Uh, we'll be seeing that here in this study. But, uh, you know, God can really do things for you even in this life. As bad as times can get, He can still bless you and do great things for you. And I've seen plenty of that. But now let's read some more scriptures here on this thing of how to obtain this millennial kingdom. Galatians chapter 5, we'll begin at verse 16. It says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Okay. In other words, when you were doing things spiritually, you're not going to worry about the flesh things, the flesh of, of feeling down and depressed and, and just, oh man, I'm, people are making fun of me and whatever. When you think about it from the spiritual aspect and saying, I'm suffering for Jesus Christ. Hey, this is great, you know. Praise the Lord. Yeah, people just call me an idiot, idiot or a Bible thumper or whatever else they call you. You go, hey, praise the Lord. Wow. Millennial inheritance. Oh yeah, you know. You look at it that way. See, you're walking in the Spirit. You know what the Bible says. You know that you believe the promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. You know, stand on the promises of God's Word. Don't be ashamed of His Word. Don't say, well, you know, try to make excuses for the Bible. Don't make excuses for this book. Okay? But now let's look at the works of the flesh. How can you tell if you are living in the flesh, if you are walking in the flesh or walking in the Spirit? Here's how you can tell. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. In other words, you can see these. They're in abundance, especially today. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, 
that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now that works two ways. Kingdom of heaven only appears in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 11 talks about the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. That's not heaven. And it's not a spiritual fellowship union with you and the Lord. Violent people can't take that by force. All right. Uh, they wouldn't want it. <laughs> the point is, the kingdom of heaven, every time it appears in the book of Matthew, is a reference to the physical millennial kingdom. That's what it's talking about. The kingdom of God, on the other hand, can refer to the same thing. It can refer to the kingdom of heaven, that millennial kingdom. And it can also refer to the kingdom of heaven is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, it says in the book of Romans. All right, It can refer to physical fellowship between you, or I shouldn't say physical, spiritual fellowship between you and the Lord. That's what it can also refer to. That's, you know, there's a dual application here in this passage. If you are walking in the flesh, you're not going to be in fellowship with the Lord. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. You won't have that spiritual fellowship. I almost said physical again. Spiritual fellowship there. But it can also refer to the millennial kingdom. If you're messing around in the flesh in this life, you're not serving the Lord. You cannot walk in the flesh and serve the Lord in the spirit. It can't happen. They're contrary the one to the other. So when you have, you know, Christian services or Christian worship that's fleshly, that pleases the flesh, it's not serving God. They're not striving lawfully, you see? Thereby they will not be crowned if they're even saved. So this passage here is talking about spiritual fellowship with God and it's also talking about millennial inheritance. So you go down through that list there, verses 19 through 21, there, first part of 21, you go down through that and you say, am I doing any of this stuff? Because if you are, it's going to keep you from getting millennial inheritance. Now look at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Okay? So you go down through those lists there. You look at the lusts of the flesh. You say, okay, I think I'm doing pretty good there. And then you look at the fruit of the Spirit. All right? You compare the two. You say, how much fruit of the Spirit do I have in my life? Do I need to do better? All of us need to do better in the fruit of the Spirit. And notice it does not say fruits plural, of the Spirit. It's singular, fruit of the Spirit. Those things that are described there, the nine things, the nine fruit of the Spirit, they are characteristics of having the Holy Spirit mightily in your life. That's what's going on there. Work on those things. Because when you do those things, you are going to earn more inheritance. Your millennial kingdom uh, reign, ruling and reigning with Christ, is going to be that much greater and you'll have a higher position in that time period because of having the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And if you're Christ, you better crucify that flesh. It talks about that in Romans chapter 12. You can read that. We're not going to go there for sake of time. Now go to Matthew chapter 20. Because I know another thing that a lot of Christians struggle with is they say, well, okay, you know, I just got saved like not too long ago. I've only been saved a couple months or a year or so. <sighs> Great, you know, I'm going to get up there and just be like, I got nothing to show for my life. I, I lived for the Lord for a couple months before the rapture happened. You know, here's the passage for you. Matthew chapter 20, verse 1. Let's start there. For the kingdom of heaven, what is that? That's the millennial kingdom is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. We are the laborers right now. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle, and saith unto them, Why stand ye here idle, or stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. 
he saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when the even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. And when, But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not, didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil, because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. All right. I do believe that there are a lot of people saved, but unfortunately, very few of them are chosen for millennial inheritance because they wasted their life away. They squandered their life away on fleshly pursuits. The lusts of the flesh are manifest in their life, and not the fruit of the Spirit. And as a result, they don't earn much heavenly reward or millennial inheritance too, by the way. They don't earn much. You say, but I don't understand what the point of the story. The point of the story is there, you have people that are in the very beginning of the day. What does the Bible say in 2 Peter chapter 3 about one day is with the Lord is a thousand years? We're at about almost 2,000 years now of church history. So you have people way back there in the first century, and they labored for the Lord. I mean, think of how many people have gotten saved and their lives changed by what Paul wrote and what Timothy did and, and what Peter wrote and, and some of these other guys. Their works that they did way back then are still blessing people to this very day. You say, wow, they're going to have so much better rewards than me. No, no, because you see, God does not judge you for the quantity of your work. He judges you for the quality. Another place in Scripture it says it's required in stewards that a man be found Faithful, not successful, faithful. Are you going to be faithful when the Lord catches you away? Will you be found faithful, I should say? You say, but I haven't led thousands of... But will you be found faithful? Another little encouragement I want to give you. As in the days of Noah, so too shall be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Matthew chapter 24 talks about that. How many people did Noah save? Seven members of his family. Hmm. And Ham went on to do some very wicked things. Interesting. Yet the Bible calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. Don't be concerned if you haven't led hundreds of thousands of people to the Lord. A lot of those guys are lying anyhow about that stuff. Uh, Jack Hiles and things like this. They're liars. They're just easy believism heretics is all they are. They just get people to pray prayers and then they say, we've had thousands of decisions. You know, and they're just like doing a rough head count. And, uh, yeah, okay, 3,000 here today. You know, It's nonsense. But my point is, God is going to judge you upon how faithful you have been. And if you have striven, you know, strive lawfully. Say it that way. If you, you know, strove lawfully, uh, you know, and did the work of the Lord according to the way Scripture says, and you don't deny the Word, and you suffer as a Christian, you're going to have millennial reign. And it doesn't matter if you've only if you get saved watching this video, and the rapture happens a month from now, or a week from now, or whatever else. God is going to judge the quality of your work from salvation until the rapture, and that's going to determine your millennial reign. All you got to do is suffer. Live as a Christian. Fruit of the Spirit. Pretty neat. The bad things that you go through as a Christian, they're going to come back to you as rewards. See? Pretty good stuff. Now we're going to go to the next section. Part 2 of this study. And uh, I'm going to show you the scripture. Uh, we're not going to go there because I'm going to end this one and we're going to start part two. And we're going to talk about what will life be like during the Millennial Kingdom. It's going to be a very exciting thing. 
So I'm going to start out part two. I'm going to actually be showing you the scriptures. Uh, I'm going to show you the verses because it's very important. I had a question somebody said about the thing of the mountains being laid flat. I'm going to show you the scriptures on that in part two. Then we're going to get into what the millennial kingdom is actually going to be like uh, that we need to be working towards. So that's going to be it. Thank you for watching.